we're going to continue with machine learning, but we can have a much more technical discussion, I think, which is probably more beneficial for our crowd. And it's also good because, um, you know, we can have a true discussion. And at the end, you're probably going to be the ones to do the, the, the work anyway. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's up to, to, to you ultimately uh, in the analysis to make the, the, the choices that, you know, with the right assumptions that, that are going to produce the right, mathematically the right results. So the key to all of this, uh, and the reason sort of it's both fun and frustrating to do, to analyze biological data is because we come to it from different uh, from different sides. All of our statistical analysis produces essentially predictive or descriptive models. When, um, so in general there are three kinds of, three classes of models broadly. There is the explanatory that explain that, you know, well, the reason the, 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 reason the sky uh, is Blue is because of all of this, right? Because we, there are two things to it, that the way we see the sky is uh, in a particular spectrum, and that's because of the configuration of our eye, and we see whatever happens, whatever the chemistry in, uh, of the sky, we, we perceive it in this particular wavelength, and that's we call blue. The other side of it is why is that, that what the, the, the chemistry of the sky is, 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 is in this particular way, well, there's all the chemistry and physics that's going on there. So that's the explanatory model, right? You can also model, you can model climate that way, right? In, on a very uh, sort of broad scale. So you understand the processes that are going into the you know, movement of air, atmospheric movement of air, creation of the clouds, creation of the rain, humidity, the cycle of humidity. That's an explanatory model of climate. The, that's not the, generally the kind of models that we computer scientists create. We deal mostly with two kinds of mo uh, models, the descriptive and predictive. Focusing actually majority of the time on the predictive. In fact, we even model, even measure the accuracy of all our uh, modeling in terms of the predictive accuracy. So, what do we mean by model? Model for us is some mathematical function or some uh, combinatorial, or math uh, well, mathematical in general, mathematical function, mostly statistical, but doesn't have to be, can be combinatorial, right? So it's some mathematical function that describes the relationship uh, between the different uh, parameters of the data, right? And fits well to data. What do we mean by fits well to data? For the most part, in statistical data mining and machine learning, the way we, we, we check for fit is in terms of the prediction, right? in terms of the predictive accuracy of the model. You have some model, let's say it's a simple one, linear regression, right? that describes the relationship between the two variables, the uh, two parameters of the data, of your data. How do we check for accuracy? How do we test accuracy? How do we report accuracy? Well, typically it's something like you know five point uh, cross validation, or you know you have your training data, you have uh, your testing data. So all of those are predictive. You fit your data, you fit your model to one part of data, and then you say, okay, if I add to my uh, data, right? To my uh, if I if I start adding data. And I use my model to, 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 to uh, decide how good of a fit that data is to previous data. So that essentially is asking, the other way of asking the same question is, how well does my current model predict what's going to happen with the new data? Right? So we measure our accuracy in terms of the prediction. We don't care whether the relationship that described by that mathematical function is a true relationship of the data. So SVM is a classical example. You can throw all your climate data at it, right? It's going to fit some multi-dimensional manifold, you know, that will describe the relationship between all the parameters of the data. And then you have new, your new data point, right? You throw it 
you add to, to, to that, you see what your function is going to tell you in terms of uh, the existing parameter, the relationship of the existing parameters, the temperature, you know, current temperature, uh, the temperature in the last five days, your geographic location, your topography, and so on, and it, it fits somewhere on that manifold, right? It gives you, and in addition to that, that manifold also tells you what then, therefore, is going to be the temperature in the next five days, right? And so that's what you're going to use as your prediction for, for, for climate. It doesn't tell you anything about why it is so. So it does not, doesn't explain why the relationship is like that. So that's, those are the predictive models. On occasion, we produce descriptive models. The problem with descriptive models, right, and the way we, we there, that's where we just measure the fit of the model to the existing data, right, without leaving anything out, without cross-validation. And there, the way we measure the fit typically is um, some form of uh, uh, you know the number of the, the data points that fit fit well to the to the model versus the ones who or the distance from the model, some combination of those kinds of things. The ones that are uh, you know if it's if it's clustering, clustering are descriptive models. Typically, uh, classification using clustering is a predictive model. So a lot of clustering is descriptive and then you're asking you know if uh, how how pure is this clustering right what's the distance between the different clusters what's the separation so so there is a there's some model behind it and you're asking how well how much of your data is exactly within the model versus described exactly by the model versus not and that's your 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 some variations of this is goodness of fit. You can ask it different, exactly the same question, right? It's, it's how uh, well does my model describe current data versus a random model. So that's another way, so that's the maximum, uh, uh, the log likelihood fit and things like that. So likelihood with respect typically to some random distribution, but it's still in, in terms of the fit of the model to the current data. The problem with that, and the problem with descriptive modeling in general, is that it's very easy to overfit. Right? And uh, that's where, so for predictive modeling, right, you're just testing how well my, does my model predict whatever is going to come in. Fine. For descriptive, how do you measure the accuracy? Well, if you just focus on the distance of the data from the model, then think of the following simple example. Suppose you know that your model, what's happening behind, what's really happening is some, is three segments of three different linear relations, right? So there's a linear regression. So you have three clouds of points, essentially, that are more or less linear related, right? You have one cloud, but then the, the, the relationship changes, so the angle of that cloud changes a little bit, and then the third segment. So there are three segments of three points, three, three uh, linear regressions. Well, one thing to do is to fit the three linear reg regression. One thing to do is to fit one linear regression, right? Then you're going to have a lot of points that are very far from, from that line. You can fit three different regressions. So it describes the relationship between those uh, the, between the two variables over time, uh, uh, for those three segments. Well, but if you're only concerned with the goodness of fit, right, then what's, what's really the best thing to do? There's even more segments. Yeah, <coughs> every two <coughs> points are going to be connected by a segment, right? You're going to have perfect fit that perfectly describes the relationship between the two variables for this data set. But we clearly understand that's not the right thing to do. And that's the problem, I mean, this really illustrates the problem with most of the uh, descriptive modeling. When you're trying to just describe the relationship, you have to control for overfit, right? Because it's clear that if we were concerned with predictive modeling, putting those uh, just segments that fit to every pair of points would not be a good model. Very quickly, we would have very high predictive error, right? Which would tell us this is not the right model. But if this is all you have, and this is all you're trying to fit your model to, you know, those three clouds of data, 
then, then you're going to, you have to somehow control for overfit. And so that's, that's kind of the main issue in, the, in descriptive data, but in descriptive modeling. And so what comes out of typically uh, computational analysis, statistical data mining or machine learning, or non-statistical data mining or machine learning, is, um, is, is a form of either descriptive or predictive model. We have to, even if we take care of all the, you know, all, uh, predictive uh, accuracy or, or not overfitting it. You know, this is what is our product. It doesn't explain what's going on. And we have to be very clear. What biologists really want is something that explains what's really going on. But no, that's where the fun starts. We generate a hypothesis. Here's how, your data, how, how these things are related. Why is it so? They're the ones we should tell and think why it is so. We cannot. We don't know the biology. We don't know the ecology, right? We can make suggestions. Certainly, we're intelligent people, right? They also can, when if we produce a model which is, you know, a good predict, even if it's a good predictive model, they may disagree that this is really not the way the relationship, the, the data are related, because maybe we took, because they understand what's going on, even if we, we think we made all the right assumptions. Sometimes we don't. Right? Sometimes we don't use the right method. So the conversation can start there. But uh, as long as we're clear, sort of what when we say model, we mean very different thing from when biologists and in general scientists say model. Okay. With that, on to predictive and descriptive models. <laughs> so um, last time we stopped at uh, discussing the tree-based model, and I'm just gonna summarize a little bit what we talked about PCA and the tree models. We, as Tanya mentioned, the PCA is an example of a descriptive model, and the main assumption that it makes is that the variance is its most important characteristic about the data, and it tries to, um, to maximize the variance in data. It also assumes linearity. The most popular version of PCA assumes linearity in relationships between the original variables and the uh, principal components. And one of the sort of uh, things that we discussed and we suggested that if we know there's some implicit redundancy in the variables, it's best not to remove it, even though the, the model is designed to remove the redundancy. But if we have some knowledge that there is redundancy in the features, it's best to, to remove those features because they can uh, lead us to make the wrong conclusions. And we talked about how the nonlinear versions of this model uh, while they're more realistic in terms of the assumptions that they make, they're not so easy to interpret. So there's that part that we need to take into account. And in terms of the tree-based analysis, it's a it's a new model now. It's a predictive model. Uh, it's a non-linear model, so that gives us more uh, richness in representation. But it suffers from the issue of overfitting that just Tanya just described. Uh, that is when we try to test this model again against a new set of data, uh, we'll have high variance in the performance results. So here's another model, the random forest, that tries to address the overfitting issue. Basically, it creates an ensemble of decision trees. And it outputs either the average, and that's the case when the variable is uh, a continuous number, or the majority vote when we have a qualitative variable, right? And so these trees are independent models. Um, what it does is for each tree, it takes a bootstrap, a bootstrap sample from the original sample, uh, meaning it, it samples um, uniformly at random with replacement. And naturally, when it does that, there's chances that you're going to repeat the same value more than once. Uh, and then it uses those different bootstrap samples for each individual tree. Uh, so that's that's one aspect of the randomization. So the other thing that it does is that each tree node, instead of looking at all the features, remember for the trees we said that um, at each yeah, node all the features are considered and the best split is decided, this one looks at a subset of the features. So there's a parameter there. If we have 10 original features, there's a parameter that controls how many features 
will be considered for analysis at each node. Let's say we only want to consider five of them. And that makes the search space much smaller and makes the algorithm much faster. So that's, after we have all of these trees, normally it builds about, the, the default value is like 500 trees. It's really efficient, even though the number sounds like a lot, it's a really efficient implementation. And it takes an average or a majority vote of all of them. So it's, it's a robust model in, in that uh, it, it doesn't suffer from overfitting. As a matter of fact, the trees are not pruned at all. They don't need to be pruned. And experimentally it has been shown to give an, an improvement of a regular decision tree result from 7% to all the way to 77%. So quite a big improvement in accuracy. And there is a lot of theoretical work to try to explain how this randomization, both in terms of the sample and in terms of the feature space, how that leads to improving in accuracy. Not everything is explained, but you know, there's definitely a lot of work that tries to prove that theoretically. And there's, yeah. So the randomization, the feature, feature collection at its node, is done, is done like uh, uniformly random? Or there are operations that consider some distributions or the feature space? Or? No, I, uh, it's done uniformly at random. So you, you just fix the parameter on how many features. Okay, so you just pick five features mm -hmm. with the same. Uh, and once you fix program. that parameter, you fix it across the trees. So you fix it for all the trees and for all the nodes in them. So at each node, each tree will only look at. You don't fix the set of features for each tree, you just say, at each node, I'm going to go and sample five of okay. ten of the okay. features. So every node of each tree has a different set of features that is considered. Right. And among those only five features, say, mm -hmm. you pick the one that you want to yes, right. explain, according to and, and the idea is to sort of look at different combination subsets mm -hmm. and the ideal scenario would be to get trees that are sort of very different in their results that they tell you something very unique and then the averaging will bring those outlier values that are closer to the center where they need to be. And this, this type of model will not help a lot where all the trees are giving the same thing. I mean, it will only help when you have a very unstable model and it will stabilize it. Which is what we had to be the, just the decision tree model. It was unstable. Okay, so there's two uh, measures that the algorithm uses, the model uses, to, to measure the quality. One is the increased mean square error, and it, it's just a, you know, this is a very common measure. It measures the difference between the um, computed value, predicted value, and the actually known value for that for that um, variable and then finds the, the, the square error for that and adds it up for all the trees and averages it and the second one is kind of more interesting the increase no node purity what it does is it uh, permutes the value of a certain variable and then it measures the effect of that permutation in the prediction if it has an effect, a big effect, if it destabilizes the, the, the prediction, that means that the variable is critical. So, um, and if it doesn't have a great effect, that, you know, you know, it's not so critical in the, in the analysis. So, so what are the, the main features? It's one of the most accurate learning algorithms out there, compares with SVM. It does really well in practice, and like I said, there's a lot of theoretical backing of it, why it does well. It can handle massive data sets, like a large number of variables because of its features, you know, subs uh, subset selection of feature space. It has a built-in cross-validation method. Right in the beginning, it splits the data into training and um, testing, and it, it computes the performance of the algorithm against this, this testing set. So you don't have to, after you're done, you don't have to cross-validate it, which is something that we do, for example, with SVM or another decision tree. So it has it built in. Um, 
it's fully parallelizable because all of those trees that are built are independent. The analysis is independent, so you could run them in several computers and then aggregate their results. Uh, and the reason that I got involved into studying this is because it does feature selection. It's an alternative for feature selection. So we talked about PCA, to use PCA to do feature selection and the assumption that it makes. So here's an alternative of a model that is non-linear, is robust and, and uh, very accurate in practice, and then offers us this capability of feature selection. And we looked at a little bit how it selects the features. We talked about the permutation of a certain variable and the effect that it has in prediction. And clearly, those features are going to be ranked really high. So, oh, so I'm going over to, um, let me first show you some results, and then I'll go back to some disadvantages. So here's some results from a data set the Weaver data set, I don't know if you remember, it's a data set that we collected the last time uh, in this class. And those are the features that we collected for the birds. The first, the first uh, column here is the first measure, the increased means uh, square error, then the second one is the increased node purity. And the way to select the important features, we want the, uh, the right balance between the two. So if a feature, for example, has high increase mean square error, but very low uh, increase node, node purity, then we don't want that. We want a feature that has both of those measures relatively high. So can you guys see? So in this case, birth species has very high increase mean square error and relatively high increase node purity. So it's going to be in the top set of important features. And I guess, can you guys see an example where one measure is really high and the other one is really low and that automatically gets disqualified? Uh, the last is third to last in the first one the, yeah. and fifth in the Yeah, so second. very good. Yeah, the, the, the distance between the nests was not a good feature here, according to this analysis. So, what are some of the disadvantage, uh, disadvantages here? One, it's, it's biased towards categorical <coughs> variables that have high number of levels. And the reason why that is because of the setup, we said that it goes and uh, uniformly selects a subset uh, of the features. So those are going to have, they're going to be more frequent, they're going to be selected more often. And they're going to pull the analysis towards them. So. It's something to consider. What we had to do in our data set, we had to simplify some of our measures, with some of the levels in our measures that were not necessarily providing any extra information. So the other problem that we had is that the trees, they're stored in computer form. But if you want to say, well, I want to look at one of those trees, they're huge. They're not pruning the trees. They, they don't need to. The accuracy is really high because of the averaging takes care of it. So they're not pruning the trees. So if you want to actually look at the rules that these trees are um, summarizing, you need to spend some time processing those trees, pruning, trying to, to twist out the right rules to, to, to keep. Because that was one of the questions that I had from the ecology students. They were telling me, well, what are these trees saying? What are some of the rules? You know, And I had a hard time with sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, open research problem on its own, how to make those trees more interpretable. Um, which trees to, to keep, it wasn't clear. It's because one tree alone doesn't, is not sort of the unit of analysis, the whole ensemble that maintains, that, that has the information on the model. You know, so you don't know which one is the one, the best one to look at, you don't know which uh, branches of the trees are more important. So it's it's quite a task to, to interpret them. But for prediction, it does really well. Feature selection is a nice feature you know, to have. Um, so if, if that's the task, it's really useful. And I, I highly recommend it. It's really fast. can handle lots of data, so lots of variables. Okay. So 
Oh, bond string. Um, so we usually, it's a descriptive type of method, and we what we use it for is to identify natural groups in data. And it's a fascinating topic. We, as humans, can do it very easily. Uh, but when you come to making the definition precise what's a natural cluster, that's very difficult to do and very subjective. And usually we want to cluster um, observations that are closer to each other and then further away from other things that are not in that cluster. But how to make that precise is not straightforward. But what do we want to use the cluster for? What are some of the tests? We want to see if there's some natural organization of the data, some natural grouping of the data, some underlying structure. Perhaps compression is another task. We have so many data, we want to summarize, summarize it. Instead of looking at each individual, individual, we look at the representative of a cluster. Or we want to do anomaly detection. If each cluster is sort of a normal, you can think of it as a normal behavior, and then anything that is very far from the centers of these clusters, we can think of them as outlier uh, behavior. Um, it's very crucial how we decide if two observations are going to fall in the same group, what kind of similarity functions that we, function we use. I mean, here's an example that I found. <laughs> and that, yeah. So are these two images similar? Yeah. So what do we use as a similarity function, right? And this is just for the fun of it, the second one. I just get carried away. When I once I found this, I went to Google Images and there were so many of them, so I had to show them several more. Right? So what is usually being used is the Euclidean distance, right? Um, sometimes correlation coefficient, cosine, similarity. And I wanted to ask, you know, Victor and Carrie here, there's this big discussion when you use, well, I don't know why, I keep on think of you guys in manifold learning, but there's this big discussion how it says the Euclidean distance is not a good distance function for manifold learning or for face recognition. Or is, is that, am I, is this something that you guys are, are aware or you, you need to use for visualization? Or? No. Yeah, I've never used face recognition before. Okay. But, some years back when I was studying manifold learning, there's this big discussion that the Euclidean measure is not, is not the right method to use, and there's extensions to kernel functions, you know, and then we run into the trouble of how do you define these kernels and, you know, things like that. We've shown that edit distance is the right one. Hmm? <laughs> With zebra recognition, we've shown that edit distance is the right one. <laughs> yeah. But it's a big part of, of when you design a clustering or you use yeah? a clustering yes. algorithm, Deciding what's the deciding what's the similarity function is a big part of or understanding the implication. So, what do you think is the implication of using the Euclidean distance in terms of uh, grouping two data points? What, it, what, could it, what is the implication if you measure the similarity of two observations based on their Euclidean distance? What, what could be some of the implications of doing that, abstracting it that way? Good question. And we, we might, Wake up. We, might, we, can't, we can answer that a little bit later, but you know, it's something that... Excuse me, So, Euclidean distance, uh, Euclidean space, right? So imagine... What are the... So imagine you have, yeah, imagine you have points embedded in, in Rn, and then you're measuring how far they are by Euclidean distance. So what are some of the implications of doing that? Like, should, should we imagine that, for example, every pixel in the image is on one dimension, so pixel n uh, ij is one dimension, and you so measure you the think, distance between the think colors? Think of each image as, you know, Right, as a set of pixels, and then the pixel second the dog is another you know, observation, and then you measure their distance. Then you're the distance between basically the difference in colors. Like, between yes, but we don't have to answer it now, but it's a question, open question. I think it's the, the 
dimensions themselves or the, the decision of what uh, is your uh, Euclidean space is more important than. Say it again, Terry, I didn't hear. The decision as to what constitutes your Euclidean space would be more important than the, using the Euclidean distance as. For example, in this case, um, you can do the similarity based on the position of the pixel, mm -hmm. or it can be based on the color. So two Euclidean. Right. That's that's another aspect. You know, they're they're both important. So they're both important, but uh, but also different. Uh, so yeah. Uh, does the similarity function in general <coughs> need to satisfy some? properties for clustering or for some other means for clustering? Right. Giant. <laughs> Can you get that in He's talking about properties of the distance function. <coughs> Does it need to be a distance in the first place? Like with the three properties? Well, um, It's symmetric, right? Symmetric. Yeah, symmetric, transitive. Symmetric, transitive, and, uh, and uh, reflexive. reflexive. Symmetric, reflexive, transitive. Yeah, but that's the definition of a equ equivalence relation. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, uh, yeah? No, no, no. no, 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 no triangle inequality. No, no, that's metric. So uh, distance function only requires symmetric and reflexive. It should be a metric right. and triangle. Okay, mm -hmm. not, not triangle. It's metric. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So a similarity function must be a distance always, or can we think about some frontier? here? No, it doesn't have to be symmetric. Okay. The distance function. The distance from A to B doesn't have to. No, it, it does. It does. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't think it needs to be a metric, although it sort yeah. of in the most common use of it is when it's a metric, but I don't think it needs to in all the applications. But isn't that the definition of Euclidean in space? It's a distance between mm -hmm. two points. Uh, it's more than, no, it's the other way around. A distance within the Euclidean distance is a metric, which is stronger than the distance. But not all metrics are Euclidean distances. And all distances are right. metric. And not all distances are metric. Distance on graphs, for example, path. Uh, uh, the distances on graphs are non uh, metric. Shortest path distance on graphs is a metric. So you can see this one is a metric. What do you do? Euclidean distance and Euclidean metric is the same thing, TPDS said. Yeah, yeah, we're talking but about non -Euclidean metric. Metric. Non -Euclidean metric. Metric in general is a function that has three properties reflexive, yeah, yeah, symmetric, yeah. and triangle inequality. It's a distance function that has triangle inequality. That's what it is. Uh, Euclidean distance is a metric. Which is why it's head. called the Euclidean metric. But uh, uh, not, 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 uh, all distances not all are metrics are Euclidean, not all distances right. are metrics, yes. Yeah. Plus, you can define Euclidean distance only on Rn, or maybe on Cn, I don't know. Right. So, you need to transform your space into Rn, and then yeah. if you want to use Euclidean. Or you can you de define Euclidean distance on a donut right topology. So then then your your what you're thinking of as Euclidean distance so, uh, or in a sphere. Tanya is hinting at why yeah. what's the implication of the Euclidean distance there. Mm -hmm. She mentioned and we'll be talking a little bit why it matters and what does it mean. In a donut what's happening? We have the donut shape and then we have something in the middle. So if we wanted to cluster the middle as one cluster and the, the shape around it as another, we can't linearly separate it. And that's one of the implications by measuring similarity of those data points by using the Euclidean distance. Because the use of Euclidean distance m means that we can linearly separate the clusters. That's one of the implications. Okay. Or it's sort of a bias. You can only find linearly separated clusters. Right, right. So, so understanding, I mean, I think there's different versions of 
the same clustering functions depending on the kind of similarity measure that you plug in, but you sort of have to understand the implication or the kind of clusters that you can discover using that similarity function. So here's, um, So here's the most popular uh, clustering algorithm. Uh, it's, it belongs to the partitional methods. Uh, it's the k-means algorithm. It's very simple. Given a set of initial seeds, it, it tries to place the observation to the closest seed or the closest center. It reevaluates the center by taking the averages, and then it repeats the process. And so here's an example. You have three clusters there, and those um, bigger dots there represent the centers of the clusters. And that's that's the objective of the um, function. Um, this is the sum of square. It tries to to place um, to minimize the distance of each observation from its center, right, across all the centers. So. What do you think is the implication of using um, the square value there? <coughs> so if, right, so if I had a observation that is really far away from the center, what is the effect in the sum? If I have an outlier, for example, that's going to, and that distance from the center, it's going to be big. Then I'm going to square it, right? It's going to have a, a big effect on where the average is going to pull the average away from. Let's say I have a bunch of points here, and I have this outlier really far away. When I try to recompute the center, it's going to pull the center away, right? So it's very sensitive to outliers. So if you we're going to talk about a lot of things about k-means, but one of the most basic things if you want to help the performance is if you know there's outliers, to do some pre-processing of the data and remove outliers because it's very sensitive to outliers. And I don't think I'm going to run this in R. Let's talk about um, sort of qualitatively features of the clustering algorithm. But, um, the other thing is the number of clusters is a parameter. And we are looking for the clusters. To, to find the clusters, we need the number of clusters, but we don't know how many clusters we need. Right? So it's a circular problem. And um, most of the people just give the parameter arbitrarily. When you have some knowledge, that's the best case scenario. But there is some implementations of the algorithm where you uh, study the behavior of the quality of the clusters as you change the number of the, uh, the value of that parameter. And you usually, so if you were to compute this, the, the sort of the dispersion, you want clusters that are really compact. And if you want to, to compute sort of the, the quality of those clusters, you look how dispersed are they, what is the sum of um, squares error. As you change the number of clusters, and you're looking for this effect. As you increase the number of clusters, you're going to have this elbow behavior, you know, that it's going to stabilize and you want to stop somewhere there, you know, before it becomes um, constant, right? Naturally, you don't want to go all the way to, to the end. Um, and if you're using R, they do have versions of k-means where that is a building, or they do have packages that you could call around the it's called one of the versions of this analysis called the gap analysis. And you could run that as a pre-processing, determine what's the right k, and then go from there. But in general, this, this issue of finding out the optimal number of clusters, the parameter k is open uh, question, is an open research. Okay. So any knowledge, if you're working with uh, another student from Princeton, any knowledge that they could have that could help will improve the quality of the result. Um, and so I want to just briefly discuss this convexity assumption. We talked a little bit about the Euclidean distance. Cases when k-means will fail. 
Is there some sort of situation that K-means will not be able to identify? And the characteristics of all of these cases is that they're not, those clusters are not linearly separable. Right? And you will not be able to find them. What could we do? What could we as computer scientists, what could we suggest to improve to improve that problem? To to, to overcome that problem? To transform the space into a space in which the clusters are. So then perhaps go from Euclidean to some kernel, this right. measure, right? Use a kernel to transform. So in here, if we have this donut space, if we instead of saying this point here is closer to this point, perhaps go along this manifold, right, and measure the distance that way. Try to, to, to follow that. Right. But of course, that requires the assumption that you are told by someone that there are going to be clusters of that shape, mm -hmm. because. Uh, either you observe the data, but if you are able as a human to identify the clusters, then why do you need a computer? Yeah, why do you need it? Otherwise, some property of the domains should suggest look for that kind of clusters. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you can run different kernels and see what. I that like I'm just going mm -hmm. for a second. So that you need some to, domain knowledge in order to figure out what cluster you need to use. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, I do. I mean. Another perhaps will be to reduce the dimensionality. Like you said, data is so complex, we cannot just look at it and say, perhaps to reduce the dimensionality, project it to a lower dimension first, explore, visual, try to visualize it in some form and see, and make the decision from then on. But it usually came in as part of a longer process rather than the only one of them. Model there. I, when I was preparing for this um, presentation, I saw a uh, suggestion that said is try to break up the space into smaller clusters, and then piece piece them those clusters together back up. But I don't know if that's again we need some understanding. If you knew that this was the manifold, then you know then you perhaps know what to do. So it's it's a circular it's a circular problem. Mm -hmm. So, um, so what are some advantages? Very simple algorithm, few lines, very easy to implement, use, efficient. Some of the disadvantages, we said it's sensitive to outliers, so the minimum you could do some outlier analysis. It's sensitive to how, I didn't discuss that, to how the initial centers are picked, and I'll illustrate uh, with another uh, link in a little bit. Um, so, if you have, I guess, why do you think that matters? Perhaps. Because there are um, local optimal. Right. You know, because the, the algorithm does not guarantee it, it, it can be trapped into some local and never discover the global, the global optimal. So it's not good with non convex shapes, and it's not good if clusters have varied sizes. If you have this huge cluster over here, Right, and then the smaller cluster. And why do you think that is? Why does that matter for this algorithm? Because it optimizes the global distance for each. Right, it uses different. averages. You know, the uh, the averages are going to be impacted by the bigger bigger cluster, right? Okay. Uh, so perhaps I'm going to I'm going to switch and show you a fun. Can you see this? Yeah, I don't know what happened. It doesn't show, but I need to go there. Yeah, could you please? Thanks. So, so here's a illustration of key names, and there's this buttons here at the top, this is uniform distribution. So with uniform distribution, how many clusters do we expect? One cluster, right? And then we have the normal distribution. We also expect one cluster. And then we have a what is called a lumpy distribution there, uh, where we have this very nice 
um, clumping uh, clusters that we can easily separate, right? And the buttons at, at all the way at the bottom here controls how many data points. And I can sort of rerun the algorithm by just hitting sample, right? So I'm just going to do this a couple of times. And it's acting like it needs to, right? This oops, here, there's two clusters. So this algorithm that I'm running has um, selects the uh, seeds randomly, but runs several times and tries to improve. It also, uh, in terms of number of clusters, it starts with a higher number of clusters and then decreases based on the improvement in performance. Okay. So let's go to the normal. So, gonna... so it's, it's behaving well, right? It's clustering only one. And then let's go to the long peak. So in general, it's behaving well. So now I'm going to select this, what is called Gigo or Gigo. Uh, but garbage in and garbage out, where it randomly picks the clusters. It doesn't iterate, it doesn't try to improve, right? It does it without caring of any uh, sort of um, important detail of the algorithm, and look what happens. So we would like this to be one cluster here, right? It completely chops it up, and I like the expression that this Professor Wilkinson and he's like, it's just like as if a monkey was chopping it without you know, having any idea what he was doing, right? So, like, why would, why would it cluster this? Right? This is a very convex shape. But it, it illustrates that you have, to, you have to take care of, you know, how you pick the seeds, the number of iterations, when do you decide to stop, all of those all of those um, elements of the analysis have great impact on quality, even for simple, separable clusters. about conversions to global minimum is not guaranteed just because of the, the way the seeds are selected. So this is very briefly other clustering methods. Uh, another category is the hierarchical um, clustering. The useful part here is that we don't need to give a parameter. There's two kinds of uh, top down. You start with one, then you split, and then you keep going, um, and then bottom up. You could start with one observation being in one cluster and then combine and combine. So it doesn't depend on fixing the parameter. And the other sort of nice feature of this kind of model is that um, it, it points out to this multi-scalar nature of the, the clusters. That at any sort of level of the tree, you could see a partition of interest. You know, and this, that is often the case, especially sort of in the kind of data that I work like I look at multi-scalar nature in time, but even in, in space, you see the same thing, right? Things are organized in a hierarchy. So a, a good question to ask is, when is one model better than the other? When is more appropriate? If you know beforehand that there is some organization, nested organization of the of the groups that you in the population that you're studying, perhaps this would be a better one to get a, a good view, and then you'll make decisions. You know, like I'll stop at this level of the tree and I'll ignore the rest of the clusters. Uh, in general, this is not as efficient as the k-means clustering, and you have to deal with when to stop at which level of the tree how to, to prune the tree. Um, and then just some insights from my own experience that, yes, we, we have all of these machine learning tools, very powerful, that can be used to generate more hypotheses about the animals that they're studying or the populations that they're studying, and, but these methods come with assumptions. And you know, studying them and understanding the implications is very important. And I think it's even important for them to understand, you know, there needs to be sort of a common ground where they too understand 
the implications of a method and the assumptions. And for the computer scientists, so understanding the, the, the data collection process, why are they collecting those features? Are they redundant features? Because it has implications in your, is it clean data? What is the amount of, is, it, is there a lot of missing um, values? So just be involved in that data collection process as well because it can affect the quality of your analysis. And then try to use their questions to you pick the right method. You know, trying to narrow down and, and, and um, restate their questions so that it leads you to the right assumptions for picking the right model. And that's it. Tanya. Well, we talked a little bit about the equation, right? We mentioned the equation. Mm -hmm. So, going back to that sensitivity to the initial seeds, how do we fix that? What do we do to fix that? We run it several times. Hmm? We can run it several times. No, you add some randomization in the algorithm, so forming sort of a random walk, not only um, deterministic steps along the iterations. So maybe sometimes you accept the move that you want to perform, sometimes you randomize it. I don't know, just I don't know if it's no, used those or not. Are, yeah. Sort of well, a like you said, you can, you can also start with, let's say, hundreds of um, initial random samples, mm -hmm. and then each one goes on its own to, to find the clusters. And then we have another right. iteration. The random, you kind of alluded to the random forest a little bit. I, I think that's a very good model in general that could be extended. You know, there you have decision trees, but you could have several k-means running independently. You randomize the input to the several k-means, and then you do averaging of their results. You know, so in general, it's a good computational model to deal with um, the sensitivity and the instability. You also play with that. Cluster, a number of clusters. Okay. Okay. How about visualization, Gary? What can we do to, 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 what can we do so we can see some of this weird manifolds? Sure, you can visualize the data, the raw data, or mm -hmm. it's very high dimensional. There are techniques to visualize high dimensional data. And probably the most common one is uh, parallel coordinates, mm -hmm. which uh, most of you, I think, are. But that, that collapses if you have, in terms of interpretation, if you have lots of variables. Right. Um, there are, it's still an ongoing research. I mean, um, I'm not aware of the latest techniques because I, I don't, my focus is not on financial data, but there is. In every visualization conference, there's usually a track for mm -hmm. um, data, which all they do is just take high dimensional data and try to find methods to visualize. But it's, you know, it revolves around you know, sometimes parallel coordinates and then even hierarchical parallel coordinates. How about that idea that the, also the random forest use where they s pick a subset of the features and then they build a model of that? Could you do that for the visualization where you, you pick a subset of the dimensions, a combination of three, right? That we can, and then you do projections, several projections and see. But make the selection of those dimensions random. That sounds like a new step. It sounds? <laughs> sounds like a new step. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Actually, Anushka has a very interesting model there because she summarizes the data statistically, collapses the dimension from n features to p statistical features. You know, she defines how clumpy the data is, how stringy, you know, the clusters are. And then you already have reduced the complexity there. And then she visualizes this N by P matrix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's definitely very interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just seeing how the visualization can be a, a basic feedback mechanism to the, you know, the machine learning. Like you're visualizing a sample of the visualization in a floor of resolution with a whole bunch of these samples and then the user is picking something like Oh, that, that's very great. 
and you know that's actually it's a project that I was involved together with Anushka we just mentioned. This was at the National Center of Data Mining, where we picked on this idea that humans are really good at when we see a cluster, we say, well, that's a cluster, and you know we could just you know go and circle it. We don't care is it linearly separable or you know we could just go around. So we started by drawing regions around the data cloud and saying, I want that to be a cluster. And then we fed that selection, I mean, you could try to describe that as a, as a overlapping space of rectangles and then translate that into a region mathematically. And then you tell the computer, well, if you find things like this, I want you, know, you, know, you to, to, to show them to me. But so the user was part of the training. And it was really, and then she, she took that further with her with her thesis. But you know, that was a very exciting idea that. Uh, sort of meta machine learning. It's, you learn the algorithm and then you use the algorithm to learn something. To we, were, we were training the algorithm. We were right. like, this is a cluster. And then mm -hmm. they, will, they will go and find some things that were similar to what we were selecting. It's like, no, I don't like this. You know, and then we were modifying the, the set of clusters. So it's a. Uh, to level machine learning process. Yeah, yeah. You learn the algorithm, and the algorithm learns. You know, the Tries to abstract what we are selecting that we cannot yeah. simply you know, abstract it ourselves. I was thinking, I don't know if you want to switch. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about this, uh, that random forest problem. Can I join you guys? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was thinking about that. Random forest uh, problem that you mentioned, how to interpret the data yes. because it's very good information. Now, I was just thinking, can you figure out some statistics about how high up a variable, a feature compares, appears in trees? Like, say you have 500 trees, and then maybe you have a statistics how often does this uh, feature appear high up in the tree? They have so, those statistics. Right. They, they record you, them. Which, right, uh, how can you exploit the statistics to say this is an important, an important feature and then maybe build a sort of a consensus tree? Although what you don't want it to have is a consensus tree. But you have a, a, a Oh, you have a consensus you, tree? No, um, you have the, the, the features ordered by importance, right? They have those two measures. So you don't even have to worry about ordering the features. Or you perhaps you want to introduce other criteria. Or okay. Yeah. They have those two uh, measures. That's yeah, but, but the problem is we interpret the data to see what that says. So one thing is this ranking. Isn't that wasn't that useful for the ecologists in our case? So you said we have this ranking. We were most able to we were able to draw some conclusions. I mean, one of the conclusions was that the tree architecture was basically the, the main determining factor. Uh, for selecting the, the nest position. Mm -hmm. And when the trees were basically very big, well, they didn't care about socializing. They had so much space that they just went everywhere. You know, so, but in smaller trees, you, we saw different, different species of birds nesting together because space was a constraint. Mm -hmm. So, but it didn't matter the kind of, so, so it was useful for that. So what other information do you think would be interesting to feed an ecologist to say, hey ecologist, this is what we can read from here. So you mentioned that there was a problem for you, so the ranking wasn't enough apparently. The problem was that the so so for example with PCA, we didn't get a nice clean drop, so I could I couldn't tell them look. Only three principal components are required, and each one of them nicely corresponds one to the species and mm -hmm. one to the so so that was not that was sort of not clean. Okay. And so then we said, well, perhaps that means that, and we do expect that the, re the relationships are not linear because we're studying complex, you know, animals here and the way it birds. So then we said, well, let's try to to compare it with random forest. If they agree, we have 
sort of, oh, they're agreeing on the same thing. So we're thinking maybe they're saying the right thing about the data. And they did not agree fully. Right? So then what do you do? I mean, the ecologists, as the computer science, are trying to understand what's happening. Right. So uh, usually, perhaps, I would make a suggestion and say, well, it doesn't make sense for that kind of bird because there's some research that shows that you know they're not very social. You know, so mm -hmm. then that's how they help. But the main challenge was to tell them, no, uh, I don't know what to do with the PCA result, what Tanya was saying. It's not, it's not the final answer. We need to interpret this. And mm -hmm. sort of walking them through the assumptions and the implications. Well, why doesn't it work? You know, why doesn't it give me the important features? You know, so explaining to them, you know, the modeling and the abstractions and, and how far it was from the kind of questions that they were asking. So that was part of the challenge. And for random forest, they wanted to see the trees. They were telling me, okay, okay so we have 500 trees. Tell me what 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 are the if conditions there? You know, like I I want to be able to list them really nicely and publish them, and you know, okay. that was not. So the ranking wasn't enough for that. They wanted to see more of a de sort of a deterministic answer to their question. Some sort I mean, of statistical ranking. It made some ranking sense. Wasn't... I mean, we published it. It made sense. No, no, it wasn't something, but you know, just I an think, age. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, they're not used to see like this. Maybe I know. Statistically, this variable is more important that like, they wanted to have like a yes and no well, trade. Well, they were like, asking for R squared. What is the R squared for this? Yeah, the, that was the only measure of success, the R squared. And there was this no purity measure, and this permutation right. prediction. And I was like, oh, this does it with respect to the variance. And this is different. It does it with respect to prediction. They're not the same model. But if they agree, they might tell us something powerful. And they're like, OK, so but what are the important so we have to say, I think these are the important features. What do you think? No, but I see, and I, and I also think that this thing is the reason why there is such, I mean, you mentioned about the theoretical work, trying to explain why random forest works so well. Because it's sort of a very They place. trust you. The thing is, when you, they trust you when you start. Yeah. You know, like, you know what you're doing. But when, when the uh, interpretation is not so straightforward, like if the, if the PCA interpretation was straightforward for me, I would say, look, there's this clean cut, and you know. All right. But when it's not, then you have to say, look, I, I don't know how to interpret. I need your help. Then you need to get them fully involved on what's going on behind the model. They weird. trust you initially. It's like, like, oh yeah, we you are excited about the randomization. We're happy for you. Tell us what you know. What's the result? Yeah, and I think that fits into the schema that. Tanya, I've seen Tanya drawing this three, four times now, about, See, it's, or it's on a, slides. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's we go down, we have a computational model, now please, that's what I can provide, now together we need to but I, I go back say, up. Right? I mean, it was a pleasant experience. Yeah. I mean, I had to learn a lot about how to say linearity assumption and Euclidean distance and convex shapes. You know, I had to, 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 to translate it to them, what that meant for them. And they had to tell me, no, I mean, Social, they social birds, and they, they have this funny words that they build condos, and they have they're very metaphorical, you know, like <laughs> this rich vocabulary that they describe their their subjects, right? And you know, I was like, so <laughs> learning it, it was a fun experience. I mean, I uh, I had to, to 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 come closer to their lingo as well. Right, and you know, one of the reason why we're having this. Classes also to establish, you know, maybe a common vocabulary, but starting to get used to and this is the way we express it. Like, yes, Victor and Carrie, we just went there, and you know, okay, class, you know, just you know, you guys have some time to absorb it, and by now they've heard it. You know, you guys need to know the assumption, this and that. You guys, we're not data coders. You know, we don't we don't just code, and they're not just data collectors. But we just had to. You know, have a crash course in that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a different dynamic. Mm -hmm. this time around. Forget that. What? Assuming they don't forget everything. Well, a lot of them, um, so Shingley used 
a, a version of random forest for his analysis. But, uh, I know that Jen, Jennifer, uh, Jenny, she used um, PCA and the different version of PCA. So they, a lot, they, they carried a lot of things that they learned for their analysis. <coughs> They were asking me, oh, if you wanted to run random forest, you know, so we, we keep in touch. And, yeah. But it's an opportunity, like the way I see it for you guys is they offer ground truth in a way. They can offer ground truth. And you could experiment with, say, if you want to improve this problem that random forest has, you want to suggest a way to improve the interpretability, they offer the ground truth to test that. They can say, yes, those are the right rules to pick. Your algorithm, your suggestions, your modeling is the right model because, you know. So that's the benefit. One of the benefits. And visualization. I mean, what can we do if we don't have eyes? Part of the project with Weaver was to do visualize the trees and visualize the weather around the trees and see how how weather affected maybe they didn't like to put their nests where there was a lot of wind or a lot of sun if they had a preference. At the end that part didn't go a lot further because we didn't have very detailed weather data. We needed the granularity of perhaps, I don't know, hour because you didn't know in advance to collect Yeah, yeah, that was one. But even, even let's say now, if someone wants to extend that, it's an interesting project. Even now, I don't know how you would collect. You know, you have to, you have the geometry of a tree. You have to put every nest. You have to collect some weather information in a very fine temporal resolution. We can scan the tree using 3D scanners to generate. The Model Simulate the weather? Um, no, I guess you can take some, at least you can figure out the direction of the sunlight and see the areas that are shaded and not shaded. Because if you have the geometry, you can sort of calculate the sunlight. We have the geometry. Do you have all the branches from the tree? We have the nests, we have characterization of the branches, whether there are multiple or one. But I'm saying the Oh, you mean real like physical geometry? We have videos. Um, so from Interest. the geometry, we can, for example, do ray tracing and see the light, see the lights <coughs> that are shaded, for example, and say, oh, these are shaded areas. And you can, maybe you can run a little bit of um, very basic wind simulation to see if this area is subject to wind or a visible block by branches. So one of the conclusions of the analysis was that weather didn't matter. But then, of course, we didn't have enough weather data. So of course it didn't matter. So they're telling me, OK, so weather doesn't matter. Yeah, but we don't have it. We were weather for a year or you know, for a, a season, and that's not enough. There's not enough variation. Or we don't have it at the nest resolution. Mm -hmm. Can we, maybe, um, instead yeah. of putting sensors on find correlation between weather conditions and geometry. That's a good idea. And then try to draw a conclusion from that. I don't know. I don't know if anyone is continuing their project. I would, I would be happy if someone did. Too. What was it? To put sensors on trees and collect information. And try, just trying to learn what impact there is. Instead of putting in other trees and then just use one experimental one tree, you can find out what the factors and go on. The other problem with the data set is that we do not have a lot of variety of trees. You know, we had I think about twelve or thirteen. So perhaps there's not a lot of variety of the architecture of the tree that you could make very sound general statements. And because how many you know, it was really, I mean, it took us hours and hours to collect. Some of them had lots of nests, and we were, like, literally measuring, you know, and it's, it has, um, it's really difficult to, to climb up, and, you know, there's uh, thorns all over, around, so. 
So Forget the lions, or no lions. There were no lions, but any other thing, you know. We just had Joseph around, scared him. What we can do is connect our own sensors to the Arduinos. Mm -hmm. Using what? Arduinos. You know what Arduinos? No. It's like a small board that's programmable. And it's very easy to program, and it can buy sensors and attach them to the board and make sensing devices that record data. But nice. how much is one of the, is it mean like million million bucks each? No, it's $35 each. 35 okay, maybe they'll develop in case of them. Yeah, you don't need the whole thing, but you don't need the whole thing. hard to... So you can, you can imagine that one tree, you can put 10 on it, it's not very expensive. And then what would you record? Temperature? Temperature. Um, you better say it's just like Yeah, and there's some accelerometers in order to see how much a branch maybe sways or something. Yeah. I don't know what that means. Yeah. And then if it's a little, there's been a money for 10 days, it will report the data. So, part, I think, Tanya, the, the, the circularity there, the feedback, should be visualization. Mm -hmm. You know how the ecologist, mm -hmm. and then visualization. And then back, yeah, I think, I think... Because that, that's what we were missing. I mean, we did, we did PCA, we did random core, and we did other models. And we started some very basic visualization of the trees, no branches, not, no other outside environment factors. But can you imagine having to mm -hmm. do rotational models of the trees or incorporating weather there? I mean, definitely, maybe we could say, oh, that, I see what's happening here. And even incorporate things like, you know, what, what do the birds see from this angle? You can get some terrain data. Is it blocked? Do they see that if there's a lot? Can you see it from the angle better? Yeah. Conclusion, right? Yeah.